right, lead heads, welcome back to the Talking Lead Podcast. This is episode 287. Fresh off the heels of our previous episode 286. As promised, I told you guys I'm going to be dropping these episodes more frequently than what you're used to. So make sure you're checking your podcast feeds frequently for new episodes. If you didn't get an opportunity to listen to 286 yet, please go back. We had the guitar legend himself, Bob Taylor of Taylor Guitars, join us. And it was a great interview. Uh, he brought his partner, Luisa. They were uh, talking about a new ebony sawmill that they purchased down in Cameroon, Africa. And they started a project. It's called the Ebony Project, to where they are setting a new standard of, of social and environmental responsibility in that area where they're educating the people on how to reforest and their commitment to cultivating a better future within the Cameroon communities and they're also doing this in some other areas across the world. So make sure you go back, check that out. And Bob also shares with us some of his overland expeditions. We're going to get Bob on in a future episode and talk about some of those expeditions that he's been on. They were pretty interesting. So this week we got another great interview for you leadheads and you knife enthusiasts in particular. We're going to be talking about the Buckmaster Survival Knife. If you guys remember that was hot back in the 80s and 90s. And uh, we've got the expert himself on, Rich Nyman, is going to be talking about the history of the Buckmaster Survival Knife. And we also have Commander Tom Coulter joining us on that and C.J. Buck. And we make a big announcement for the possible release of a 2.0 version of the Buckmaster. So make sure you guys tune in for this. You're not going to want to miss it. This episode is brought to you guys by Keltec. Keltech Weapons. Check them out, keltechweapons.com. Find them on Facebook. Find them on Instagram as well. If you're a listener to Talking Lead, you're no stranger to Keltech and their products. They make some awesome bullpup rifles, shotguns, their pistols. Their new CP33 in a 22 LR is a really cool new firearm that they've produced. You guys go check it out. They've got all the specs on their website. And then they've got the new KS7 bullpup shotgun. Very similar to the KSG, except it's a single tube versus the double tube that the KSG was famous for. Uh, and it's coming in at a really good price as well. You guys are going to love that. So great opportunity to get you a bullpup 12-gauge shotgun. Keltechweapons.com. And then, of course, the official optics of Talking Lead is Ride On Optics. That's R-I-T-O-N Optics. Let's so go to their website. Check out their full lineup of rifle scopes, red dots, and they've even got binoculars there. If you guys want to check out that one to eight that they've got, it comes in a, a hunting version and a tactical version, two different reticles there. I've been rocking the tactical one on my 18 inch AR556 and loving it. And you guys who follow our three gunner, Casey Griggs, CG3G, he just recently got one of those as well, and he's loving it too. You can go to his Instagram page and check out all the pictures and videos that he's been doing with the Mod 7 one to 8 by 28 Tactical. So before we get into our Buckmaster Knives interview, we got to take care of some jack wagons. So Gunny, bring that jack wagon train in. Hey, Ralph, Semper Fi, do or die, hold them high at 8th and nine. It is time for the Talking Lead Jack Wagon of the Week, so brace yourself, baby. All right, so we're going to have a quick Jack Wagon train this week because we want to get into this interview. You guys are going to absolutely love hearing about the Buckmaster knife history. So this Jack Wagon comes to us from Leadhead Jason Edgar, and Jason sent, has sent in uh, a couple, but this one uh, I've not, uh, not heard much about this one. It, it takes place in California. And he sends me a link to uh, a YouTube channel, and it's the Gun Guy TV YouTube channel. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that or not. I tried searching this on the internet to find uh, some background about it, but I couldn't find any news stories on it, <laughs> shockingly enough. But uh, if you guys go to Gun Guy TV, it's uh, Cal DOJ Stormtroopers Confiscate Guns from Law-Abiding Citizen. Apparently, this guy did a, I don't know if it's a cell phone video or something like that, but uh, he went to register some guns. You guys may or may not be familiar, but California, you know, they're always making their gun laws more strict, convoluted, and impossible to follow. 
and this guy was just trying to be a, a good law-abiding gun owner, and he was going to register some guns that had fallen on their latest their latest BS gun law. And this is what happens when you do that in California, apparently. So it says, uh, and again, this is from the Gun Guy TV YouTube channel. What we were always sure would happen is happening. The California Department of Justice is actively confiscating guns from law-abiding citizens who have made understandable mistakes while attempting to obey California's complicated and convoluted firearms laws. Well, they do that on purpose, no doubt, uh, for this for this particular reason. Uh, this video shows California DOJ agents in the act of confiscating firearms from a law-abiding Californian. So basically, in a nutshell, this guy went to register his guns. I guess he got flagged. And then four, they sent out four uh, DOJ police officers to confiscate this guy's guns. He was trying to register, and from what I could make from the video, he had done some some 80% lower builds, uh, AR pistol builds, and they came out to take the guns instead of letting him register them. So it's really hard for me to really comment on this because I don't know the whole story. Uh, the video just cuts in, seems like halfway through uh, when they're coming to, to take his guns, but it's very obvious that these police officers don't know the law themselves. They were just sent on a task to take these guys' guns and that's what they were hell-bent on doing. Uh, didn't give him really a good explanation or reason uh, as to why they were doing it. And as the guy was questioning them, the officer in charge got uh, very irritated. I mean, you could tell that these guys really didn't want to be there in the first place and that they really didn't have any intentions of answering any of these guys' questions because they, you know, they didn't have the answers for him. And you could tell that they were getting very frustrated with the questions that he was asking. But very interesting. If anybody has any more information on this story, please send it to me, talking at gmail.com. Uh, I'd like to get a little more background on what's going on with this. Um, but the Gun Guy TV, uh, don't know that guy, but you guys can go to his YouTube channel, check out that video, and watch it firsthand. So that's it. That's all I've got Jack Wagon wise this week. Like I said, just wanted to get a, a quick one in. It wouldn't be a, a complete show without a Jack Wagon. So Gunny, get that train out of here and let's go ahead and jump into this awesome interview with Rich Nyman, Commander Tom Coulter, and CJ Buck talking about the legend, the Buckmaster survival knife. Day three, guys, and we're still pumping. 2019 SHOT Show at the official headquarters of Buck Knives. And joining us again, we have the, the privilege, the honor of having C.J. Buck join us. Thank you, sir. And C.J. has brought along a couple of friends. We've got uh, Tom Coulter, which you guys heard from Tom a little bit earlier ago. Commander Tom. And uh, Tom has a friend. I'm gonna let you introduce your friend here, Tom. He's got Rich, some goodies for us, some info. Rich Nyman is a uh, a documenter of events and things that have impacted Buck Knives. Uh, one of them is the Buckmaster, and the other one is the M9 bayonet. And from that, I'll introduce you to Rich. Rich, welcome in, Rich. Thank you very much. So I'm excited uh, for our topic that we're going to talk about here. Uh, you've written a book, actually. Yes, sir, I did. A couple uh, of them. A couple, yeah, couple of books. Two of them. Yeah. Uh, the one that we're, we're looking at now is the Buckmaster Knives. And it's the authorized history of the models 184 and 185. There you go. Yeah. And that's that's kind of going to be our topic today. Yeah, so I'll tell you how it kind of started. Let's, let's hear the history of this. All this right, awesome. so it's really good history. So uh, C.J. Buck and myself uh, met, met acquaintances over 10 plus years ago. And C.J. Uh, saw my, my uh, appreciation of the Buckmaster because when I was a young kid back in the 80s, uh, I loved the Buckmaster knife. So uh, uh, CJ says, hey, bro, why don't you, you write uh, something for the Buck Collectors Club? It's I a, never talk like that. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> First, <laughs> off, the, the, First the, off. The, B, the BCCI. I'm going to stop you right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the BCCI. So my small little document was a PDF, and uh, Mr. Forsman, rest his soul, I kept sending 
uh, uh, another change and another change. It ended up being 73 pages long that they posted wow. on the, the Buck Collectors Club uh, website. So uh, I started my new job at the world's largest Dodge dealer, Dave Smith, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And uh, uh, CJ took me to lunch to Panda Express. I even remember when it first opened. <laughs> Big All right? spender. No expense. Yeah. Panda Express. Yeah, Panda Express. I've been known to, to have a little bit of Panda Express myself. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. so we, love, we love go have a nice lunch with Orange Chicken. And uh, <laughs> uh, CJ uh, says, hey, Rich, why don't you write a book on the Buckmaster? And I said, are you kidding? I said, my goodness. I, I my grades were were so bad in in, in college. <laughs> a few, expl- you know, a little bit worse than that. Right, right. And I said, no, black and white. You know, that's not my. Yeah. And he goes, hey, you're not thinking about it. You're 73 pages into this book. And then eating on on my food, I looked at CJ and I said, well, will you authorize it? And he says, heck yeah, I'll authorize. It. I said, will you grant me access to Buck? To get the exact numbers of the production numbers, so I can do this right. No. He goes, yeah. So one thing. Oh, just see, and there was so much passion there. So how do you how do you, how you say, say no, no to that, that right? Yeah. 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 And uh, one thing led to another. It was a three and a half year project to write the book. And uh, the next person I contacted was Paul Boss. He's a world famous uh, heat treater, a very good friend. Uh, uh, you know, just a wonderful person. And him and, and uh, CJ's father, rest his soul, Chuck, uh, go way, way back with uh, CJ's uncle, Uncle Frank, who passed away years ago. We used to run around with uh, them. And uh, Paul started talking to me about all these companies. This one company called Frobis slash Qualitech, which was the first original company. Okay. And I started doing more digging and digging. And um, uh, I discovered that Qualitech was a company that made special uh, um, uh, weapons and items for uh, naval special warfare. Okay. And uh, some of the ABC groups. Types like Tom. Yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah types <laughs> yeah. like Tom, yes. Um, Which is how we ended up meeting Tom. Yeah, so I'm doing my research. I find out, hey, there's a guy named Harry Kampheisen, and, and Harry was part of this Qualitech group with a gentleman named Mickey Finn who owned a deli in uh in southern uh florida there in oceanside uh-huh. so harry had a pawn shop called called jerry's military pawn okay and he would you know always pawn to the military guys right. and stuff and he had the ffl and then uh mickey had an affinity for uh for and harry was a buck dealer by the way yeah okay yeah, harry when White. they started collaborating together harry already knew of our company down in san diego gotcha yeah so um, they're making. There's. There was a bar down there called Dooley McCluskey's, correct? Tom's laughing. I bet, yeah. they, had, I bet they had a dartboard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, at Dooley McCluskey's, there, uh, um, they have this corner, and that's kind of where they used to hang out. Okay. So okay. You, you've got a picture of this in the book. Yeah, I nice. do. Nice. And I also have a picture of a special suppressed uh, 22 that. Used to, with a Ruger suppressed 22 that used to be called a hush puppy, but uh, that was uh, terminology for the teams. Okay, but the uh, they used to make weapons like this. This is why I described that in my book. Okay. Very cool. And uh, now is that a? Um, that's not a can you can take off. It was made that way, right? Correct. Suppressed. Yep. In, the, integrally suppressed. Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. Tom. Tom. Tom nodding on the radio doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come so, on, guys, give me so, a break. All right, all right. This is the second time. Yeah, so what happened is uh, um, there was a request that they wanted to replace the archaic K bar. K bar, beautiful knife, but, you know, for, yeah, for some of the stuff that, that uh, they needed some sort of anchoring device. So Mickey Finn showed up with three blades, two or three blades from Jimmy Lyle. Now, back in the day, you know, this is before internet and, and everything, and you had to actually call the phone. And the Rambo knife was the Lyle knife. And to own the Lyle knife, it, it, back in the day, it was $1,000 to buy this thing. So Mickey Finn had three of these knives at that bar I just showed you a picture of. Well, $1,000 back in those days. Too, lots yeah. of money, right? Yeah. And uh, somebody requested that, hey, we need to have it 
be some sort of anchoring system. Uh -huh. So in my further dealings, I uh, I made a I was told by Harry uh, that I should call his friend Tommy, who was commanding officer of of, uh, of uh, SEAL Team Three at the time, and I called up and I talked to um, Tom's wife. Um, and she that said, to me like I said, Hey, passed around from, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, cause I was doing, a lot I was here. doing my research, you know? Yeah. And I said, everybody's got different recollections, yeah. and different conversations. Yeah. So what Rich was able to do was go around, reconnect with each one of these, each one of these people, right. catalog and everybody's yeah. little tidbit yeah. and then put all of those little pieces into an overall picture that none of us completely remember right because we weren't there to hear the discussion that went on in our absence yeah. it was quite fascinating he, we'd sit down we'd go out to lunch and he'd, he'd share with me some interview he just got done doing or yeah. he'd flow to somebody's house and sat with them over over dinner and <laughs> a couple drinks too many maybe but <laughs> but uh, uh, and he'd come back with these stories of did you know that after this meeting they all went back out of powwow and this was the discussion no I had no idea right I, was on sure. the other side of that negotiating table. So it's just fascinating stuff. Even for me who lived it, it was fascinating stuff to listen to. So here I am. I, I, I talked to, um, uh, I, I'm looking for Tommy Coulter. And and uh, Mrs. Coulter told me, son, you do not call him Tommy. This is, <laughs> to you, he is Commander Coulter. I said, yes, ma'am. So from <laughs> then on, <laughs> so... I, I, in my talkings with the commander and doing research with him, and it was, again, it wasn't, uh, I was writing stuff down as I spoke to him, and any, like any, any good writer, and not to say that, but any good writer, you always do your research, so if you hear a story by one person, you kind of try to collaborate well, to with collaborate, somebody else, so yeah. I did that on That's everything. That's a lost art, it seems even, to me, with even, <laughs> even when, these even, types of writers even when days. Tom told me one thing I did, I wanted to hear it from somebody else. So rumor had it that somebody wrote some drawing of the, the, the pittance, which is the anchors on the Buckmaster on a, a beer bar napkin from Dooley McCluskey's. So I'm, I'm telling uh, Tom this, and uh, he says, son, you know who that, that seal was? I go, no, sir. He goes, that was me. I go, hey, do you have the napkin? And he laughed at me. <laughs> so Long um, gone. Huh? Yeah. So um, the, the knife went through some transformations. Uh, the, the book uh, goes through that in, in thorough detail. Yeah. And there's three different generations of knives in, in the book. And the first generation had uh, all saw teeth originally. They were all handmade by a gentleman who passed away recently. His name is uh, uh, Robert, and we knew him as Bob McDonald. And uh, Bob McDonald was a friend of Mickey Finn since childhood out of Bakersfield, California. Him and his son were recruited into uh, a Qualitech uh, at the time. Okay. And uh, I'm showing him some of the original pictures. Yeah, he's going of, through and showing me some pictures. Yeah. Now, so, now so see this, the, the dolphin there? Yes. The Frobus. The Frobus? Frobus. Yeah, okay. that was their company Frobus. logo. Frobus. Oh, okay. Okay. They made a dolphin out of their name. That's yes. cool. Now... I would explain this, nice. but I have the master here. I would like, sir, if you would please tell us about this Frobus. I was approached by Mickey Finn, and he said, we're going to uh, establish another company, and I'd like to use the term Frobus. It's a term that I've used throughout my career, and it means nothing particularly, but when you're in a situation and you can't necessarily come up with the right word, I would always inject Frobus. Okay. So, <laughs> cluster frobus. <laughs> yeah. Right. Things yeah. like that. So Mickey said, "Well, we'd like to use it." And I said, "You know, I don't have a problem with that, and I'm, I'm honored that you would consider it." I said, "But I spell frobus P H R O B U S." Right. And that's my business. And if you would like to spell it P H R O B I S, I have no problem with that at all. So he said, "Done." Good enough. You'll do it. <laughs> So, so even though they sound alike, well, they're generous, vastly different. Right. So this was Frobus One of the three Frobus companies, and there's a fourth international that I'll discuss real quick. But what's so cool about the development of this knife? So what I want to do real quick, um, as our listeners are listening to this, go to the internet and look up Buckmaster, Google Buckmaster, and you'll see the knife that we're talking about. 
and it's kind of reminiscent of the one that Rambo used. Yeah, very much so. I um, mean, just just a real quick get a picture in your mind kind of knife there. So All right, continue, so, please. Um, they they were working on some modular ideas, which a lot of the development of the Buckmaster rolled into the M9 bayonet in in uh, uh, finalization of, of the knife for the military. But they wanted to uh, be modular, so there were some small blades, big blades. Um, different size uh, anchors, right. different types of handles, and that that's the development. Now they made six specifically for the SEAL team, and they actually named them one of six, two of six down the line. And on the front cover, you'll see number one of six. Oh, nice. Okay. okay. And now, are um, these all at your your facility? Not any. No. no. Not any. These anymore. are all part of Rich's collection. Yes, okay. which so is you're carrying the history. Now. Yes, so okay. I'm carrying the history, and, You've got the and museum. Uh, some of them are in museums now. Oh, okay, really? Yes. Okay, nice. And uh, I was being a wise ass. No, but they they really are because they're they're one offs. They're all made by hand by this wonderful guy named Bob McDonald. What was so cool on the seal one, the number one of six, Buck and um, uh, Frobus Company at the time, they worked together. So Bob McDonald and Rick McDonald made some parts for it. And the Buckeyes kind of finished some of it up. So right. the, the six of them that are in here that are just like this, mm -hmm. okay, led, you know, that that was just so nice because it was a collaboration. And in the hardback book that I sold out of years ago, I had their, everybody's autograph who was a part oh, of that team, nice, okay, man. including, uh, you know, CJ's father. Now, there's a story behind all this. That's CJ awesome. was a young guy at the time. Now he's he's uh, older, a bit grayer, but has a heck of a lot of nice hair. Yeah, this, look this, look this, him up. <laughs> this was in uh, 1984. So I was, I was 24 years old. Yeah. Okay. So Doing special projects for Buck Knives. That's what that was my job at the time. It, that was his very first job. So here's a nice picture of him in my book. And they never let pictures. No way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Who's this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who's this yeah. guy? Hey. I gotta post that on the interwebs. <laughs> yeah. You can. <laughs> I have a talk about throwback Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. All right. There's, so there's a dumber one in there. Yeah. So he he <laughs> uh, he approached his uh, father a few times. Hey, you know, I, I have a work order, and I actually had the original work order from the the, the teams uh, uh, requesting 20 knives so they could test them and stuff. So, um, you know, there's some bureaucracy there, and, and we had to wait and. Uh, finally, his dad said, okay, here's this young guy, you know, he's full, vibrant, it's his very first project, okay, we'll give him the chance. So right. they started uh, making it because they were waiting for the military to finally stroke a check and, and, and uh, get get the get knives. The greenlit, yeah. Yeah. So um, what happened that year, it was actually December, uh, November and December of 1984 was the year that these knives were actually being Put in production and right as they were building them they you, you they tighten them down and then all of a sudden you hear ting 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 and they're like oh my goodness so when they're tightened down the the, the handle mm -hmm. and the pommel and the blade or not the pommel but the quillion and the blade they were the uh, the process of hardening the blade made them so hard that they became fragile oh so paul <laughs> boss paul boss the world famous heat treater they said, hey, Paul, uh, can you anneal these? So what they did is they undid all those knives before they shipped them out. And he was out there, and Paul told me that it took his whole weekend. He had like 500-plus blades that oh, he was wow. fixing. And he, with a blowtorch, and he's such a master uh, heat treater. Yeah, I can't, eye, eye, I can't tell you guys. Yeah, he yeah. just with his, his expertise with the blowtorch, he got every single one annealed to the exact temperature he needed so it would not break. Right? That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And what's what's so important... That was an ass saver, too. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> it was. It, and what's so cool about Adapt that is... Adapt to overcome, right? Yeah, that, that, that heat treating led to, the, uh, led to the different heat treating of the M9 bayonet blade, which... You know, it had to, I'll explain that in a minute, but it all this is leading up to that. So okay. on the prototype on the front of my book, of Buck Nas Master Knives Authorized History, you can see a spot where where the cross guard is. Well, story was, um, SEALs came back from uh, op. They went to the fridge at, at Qualitex slash Frobus, 
Uh, a seal looked around. He grabbed the beer out of the fridge. This is for, for twist offs and stuff. He grabbed the beer out of the fridge, looked around. The prototype was on uh, Mickey Finn's desk, and he tsk, opened up the bottle of beer with that. Well, Bob McDonald <laughs> actually witnessed this. That's and, the first thing came to his mouth. Yeah, the well, yeah. Tsk, you know, or or Crown Royal, right? Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, what was so nice is in the future with M9 Bayonet, that idea of a bottle opener was encompassed in the the the, the uh, Quillian slash cross guard for the M9 Bayonet for weight reduction. Oh, so nice. just watching that happen, it was like it's, it's a series of crazy idea, you know? yeah crazy yeah. events led to one thing another. So okay, they're heat treated now, okay, yep. and they're being shipped out. Well, gosh, in 1985, I was running around a mountain. Uh, a church camp. My dad's a Greek Orthodox priest. No sisters. I had a buck knife because I wanted the seal knife, and uh, I couldn't afford a Lyle knife because I called Jimmy Lyle and he told me it cost a thousand bucks. And I about dropped my my yellow rotary phone, which you, you millennials <laughs> don't know what the heck that is. But all right. So, uh, long story short, um, we had green in my house. Yeah, yeah, green. green okay. Rotary. Yeah. So, um, uh, Rambo two came out. And that like propelled it, this knife. Enter Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and then everybody wanted the Rambo knife. It wasn't a Rambo knife. It was better, honestly. Uh, the weak part, unfortunately, was the tip. Was this the knife he used uh, in the movie? No. Oh uh, no. Okay. No. No. no but no. a lot of people mistook it for the knife yeah. used in the for movie, that. which didn't hurt us at all. Yeah. At all. Yeah. And and uh, was and, that knife based on this knife? Yeah, again, yeah, the Jimmy Lyle knife was a conceptual, it was a, uh, the knife used in Rambo 1, okay, yeah. and everybody loved the survival knife idea. Yeah. yeah. No, so. the, kni the knives weren't based on each other at all. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Not at all. I was saying it, they stole your idea. No, 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 no. no. Or, or the reverse knot, no. nothing. No, no, no. no, no it no. was just back in the 80s, survival knife. It was cool, yeah. yeah. Right. The hollow-handled knife was really just starting to move through. Uh, and a lot of the early prepper, that's sure. just such a mainstream idea now, was kind of a fringe custom knife element. I don't even think prepper, 80s. that didn't even exist no, back that then. No, that term didn't even exist. It was survivalist but at, that's, at the time. That is, it's the same group. I mean, it's the same sure. folks. Just people really yeah, wanting just to be prepared. Over, yeah. yeah, over the decade. So a tremendous amount of knives were sold. Well, in 1985, uh, in June, the SEALs actually took... Um, uh, they they paid for and took order of 2,500 uh, knives. And I'm, if you would just collaborate just a little bit on that. At the time, I was the uh, the head of the program office for Naval Special Warfare in the Naval Sea Systems Command under uh, C06, and my uh, office code was 06Z. And one of the things that we had were the responsibilities for life support and weaponry and we uh, we went after and tested uh, the new knife blade and uh, the Buckmaster was was the selected choice so the first order that was uh, submitted was for 2500 and that was approved by uh, Admiral Wayne Meyer so uh, production went went on and uh, they were waiting for this original order, and they were so busy that year, they were so busy that year with those knives, CJ said that they just grabbed them off the shelf. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and, and the so original... That, that first year, we sold over 50,000 units. Are you serious? Of, of this knife. Oh yeah. my gosh. It, yeah. just, it took off beyond our wildest dreams. Yeah. That is amazing. And I'll tell you, Rich so, uh, didn't talk about, but it, it originally, my father was very leery of manufacturing this knife because buck knives weren't we didn't make fighting knives right so that, the hunting that held him up he, he looked at that and and got very nervous and we were and, and and just logically looking at that knife it's one of the worst fighting knives ever it's very much a survivor <laughs> survival tool multi-purpose kind of i mean other than having yeah. an edge or just being big enough to be a club it's a tool it's, it's a really not a good fighting knife. yeah so then uh, came yeah, I guarantee you that the people who were buying that knife didn't know what the the prongs were for either did yeah, they yeah it's funny yeah. that's so funny yeah it's so true it was originally for an anchor that's correct it was um, the idea of having an anchor on your diving knife or the knife that you would dive with 
was important because of things that you could secure underwater and you needed that anchor and it needed to be such that it would have the strength to withstand any kind of wave action and so forth. So my contribution or, or my suggestion was you needed these pinions to uh, be applied and they would form the basis for the anchor and it would be it would be substantially more useful underwater than just the knife alone. Right. And uh, the, the, the anchors were the actual Because I remember seeing these patent. when I was younger. Yeah. And I was like, what are those for? Yeah. And you yeah. could what are those them? spikes? Everybody you calls know. them spikes. Yeah. I would tie a, a string around them, yeah. and I would use them as, um, uh, like, what are grapple. those? Grapple. Grapple. Yeah, grappling yeah. hooks. Yeah. 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 I would use them as grappling hooks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, uh, then came the development of the light Buckmaster, so it's the Model 185. Okay. okay? And it was streamlined originally and bucket. skeletonized. Yeah, skeletonized. Yeah. So uh, there wasn't any any anchors anywhere on it, but there's anchoring points. Right. And that was uh, there was a lot less numbers of these ever made. Um, and then uh, they did you know beautiful customs. You had Damascus Buckmasters, extremely rare. The Stag is the rarest versions. Um, do you have pictures of that I, in there? I do. I have all kinds of pictures of all long bladed Buckmasters. Yeah, this is a beautiful of, book, guys. Uh, thank you. I mean, he's, he's got it very well illustrated with the pictures, uh, and then of course the descriptions and everything that goes along with this. So, um, so for for people that wonder what goes on behind an idea, actually getting to production, yeah, and how convoluted that that journey this is a can classic. be. This is this is a good collection of just how crazy that can be oh nice that's cool and uh, we just it, you know it just goes through all that I even did the sheath development even the wire cutters they the the seals uh, I, I sir I don't know exactly who asked for the wire cutter but somebody did do, do you uh, remember you, or? no it, it was um, anything that that we start seeking out has to have an operational requirement and part of the operational requirement or the operational specification was the ability to cut wire and therefore that characteristic was adapted to the Buckmaster. And they put that in the sheath. Yeah, and that was the, sh the, that was the second Not version. that this couldn't do it, but yeah. that was specifically for that. Correct. Yeah. Matter nice. of fact, uh, Doug Olson handmade a small little one that attached to where the uh, handle is on, on the original. And it could cut wire like a Dickens. There's only two of them. It's in the museum in Idaho right now. Oh, cool. Yeah, but it's uh, at Glenn Maddox's museum in Post Falls, Idaho. It's one of the most detailed uh, uh, U.S. military historical museums on a small scale. It's fantastic, from Revolutionary War to the modern Gulf. Okay. So I put that in there. Okay. So what's nice. so important about the SEALs requesting this is that this wire cutter idea led into another development. So. For Frobus, let's get that just real quick and I'll, I'll bust it out. So Frobus 1 was the Buckmaster, Frobus 2 was the Model 185 Buckmaster Lite, and Frobus 3 was the Model of the Year in 1987 folder. It's called the Titanium from Buck. Titanium? It, yes, it's a titanium folding knife that you would take apart. They called it the Take Apart. Oh, no. Knife of the Year. It's in here. Paul, the engineer from Palmetto State Armory. I don't know if I introduced you to him. You didn't, no. Okay, he, he really wants to meet you, but he's he's a huge fan. You know, he's got knives ever since. He was talking about he's got the Buckmaster. And he was talking about I got this titanium one too that you could take apart. Right here. Yeah. He was talking so about it. Yeah. I have the prototypes in here. It was a collaboration of, of uh, Harry Camp Heisen and uh, Bob McDonald together. Here's the prototypes. But okay. that was knife of the year. Isn't that cool? Here's the wood one, and then the solid one. Oh, very cool. <laughs> yeah, you could literally yeah, take it apart. Yeah, we eventually, we put that out for a few years as a take apart, and customers couldn't stop losing the parts. So, and what so year was this? eventually we transitioned it to a non-take apart. I was going to say, what, what was the purpose of giving the ability to it's take it apart? It's strippable. Feel strip it? Yeah. Okay. So Clean um, it. Whatever, yeah. yeah. So that was Frobus 2 slash Frobus 3 rolling into the M9 Bayonet. So it's the venerable M9 Bayonet became, came. this is the, the father of the M9 Bayonet. This M9 and a lot, bayonet. Of lessons, nice. a lot of lessons on heat treating, metallurgy. And talk about the M9 Bayonet for our, our All listeners. All right, so, so my second book I wrote, 
uh, was, it's called the M9 Bayonet, the Authorized History. Thank you, CJ Buck. Um, uh, that took five and a half years of research. I had uh, uh, Captain Michael Hawk, uh, uh, a veteran he was in since he was 18 years old, bless him. And he was one of the very first Green Berets to hold the M9 bayonet. So that's why I thought it was an honor to have his captain, last captain commission in Moore um, uh, on the front cover of my book, okay? Cool. Now the M9 bayonet, uh, there was a rumor and I read that it was uh, a Doug Olson who actually heard back in 1984, 85, that hey, the Army's looking for a new bayonet. Because the Russians had one, they could mount it on, you know, and they could cut wire and do different things. Right. So um, there was something called the, this is during the Reagan years, okay. okay? And this small little company went through all these developments, and what was so crazy is all this cool stuff on the, M9, on the uh, uh, Buckmaster led to the M9. So you had the bottle opener, the sheath, the being modular, mm -hmm. it could, it was made to cut through the fuselage of, of a helicopter. Uh, CJ's uh, there's a beautiful explanation of the knife that it was supposed to cut yet not snap you're supposed to be able to twist you're supposed to be able to it, cut it was and all pry. the dichotomies it had to be heavy but light yeah. hard but soft <laughs> yeah. uh, super durable but fully corrosion resistant but fully this fully that all these dichotomies that you right. find and so our job was man how can we walk that dynamic tension fence line where we're, we're not being too much of this, we're not being too much of that, but we can deliver a product that delivers both. Right. And rather than the making perfect. a compromise of one to the other, we have to deliver both. And it was a real heat treat, uh, materials choice, it was a real challenge to do that. Yeah. And, and it, I'll, t I'll tell you a quick story on that, These those saw teeth on the back of the Buckmaster, uh -huh. once you punch that through the side of a fuselage, you couldn't get your knife out again. <laughs> So as a saw, it out? Yeah. as a saw, you, it couldn't function. So that's yeah. that. So the a lot of R and D from the Buckmaster, as Rich was explaining, and it does so in his book, went into the changes we made on the on the bayonet. Nice. And then they had a genius idea because they kept having wire cutter ideas. Uh -huh. And the very first uh, prototypes they sent to the army were just a gift to say, hey, this is us. We're Frobis. We're tiny. We do all kinds of cool stuff for. Uh, Naval, Naval Special Warfare and different ABC companies consider us, right? They already knew it was too heavy. Well, they ended up submitting the, the venerable XM9 number 29. So there's a few um, companies, including ITRON and, and quite a few others. Uh, I've, I got to see real detailed pictures of the ITRON. I know somebody has one. And uh, yeah, It should be noted that Buck had to win a contest based on performance. In other words, there were operational requirements that they had to meet, sure. performance they had to meet, <clears throat> and then there was a variety of knives. It was cut down to three, and Buck was selected based on the best quality, best product for the price. And it yeah. wasn't to the lowest bidder. Sure. It was for the best quality for the product. Best performer, yeah. To yeah. protect Correct. our troops. So yeah. that's... You know, it, it, it's oftentimes said, well, you know, it morphed from the Buckmaster to the M9. It's not exactly true because the Army was responsible for fielding the bayonet. So they ran the competition. Gotcha. And, and they, were, they were very hard on the equipment. Sure. So, so Buck did well just to survive. <laughs> yeah, they had zero failure. And They're the only uh, com competitor that had zero failure. So it, it's it's noteworthy that Buck didn't get it because of the Buckmaster. Right. They got it just because they didn't take him just because you had the Buckmaster. No. You gotta but it's got to earn it. it. It's also interesting to know that the first, second, and third derivative of the Buckmaster contributed to the M9 bayonet overall ability to perform, yeah. including yeah. the sheath. So yeah. it was a natural progression to get it. Just That's so happened correct. it met all those yeah. specs. Again, you have to have an operational requirement and you have to have a military specification and the weapon has to meet or exceed those specifications, both operationally and tactically. And I have seen some military uh, specification manuals that products have to go through and it's quite detailed. You know, it's well, not it's, a sheet of paper. It's got to do this, this, and this. It's it's about as yeah. thick as Rich's book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Right. Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> it's almost 500 pages, that one is. We did a show not too long ago um, when the, the Army was going through picking their new handgun, you know, the different guns and all the processes, and they got to meet this, they got to meet that. Uh, we did a, we did an episode on that. So very, very similar process what he's talking about there, guys. Yeah. Well, the process, the acquisition process applies in part to all weapons, whether they're a firearm, an edged weapon, whatever they are. Yeah. And and you have to have an operational requirement, and you, it has to meet the operational requirement. The specification is derived from the, the requirement. Yeah. yeah. So the rest is history. The I mean, it's the history. longest r running bayonet in U.S. military history. And you've got a separate book for that, right? Yes, sir. And what's the name of that uh, book? Again, it's called The M9 Bayonet, The Authorized History. The Authorized History. And that's almost history. 500 pages long. This one, the first one, The Buckmaster Knives, um, The Authorized History is the Model 184, 185. It's uh, 373 pages long. Where can our listeners get your books at, Rich? You know what? Buck Knives. Buck Knives? Yes. Okay. www.buckknives.com. Uh, .com. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's under book, not books. I tried it. It's book, <laughs> and then both the books are are currently there. Very nice. So. Okay. And then. Uh, okay. So can we talk about this now? Uh, it's <laughs> so this, up to this, CJ. Yeah. This is this is what we've been leading up to here. So uh, we just heard the history on the Buckmaster, and uh, its progression, and now we're at uh, 2019, year mm -hmm. 2019. So it just makes sense that such a popular knife would get a facelift, right? The, the, the Buckmaster 2.0, the, uh, the combat diver knife. The concept for the Buckmaster 2.0 is the, Buck, the Buckmaster was a popular and, and useful edged weapon. It was now time to develop the follow-on edged weapon and the Buckmaster 2.0 started to materialize. I felt from the beginning that the blade design as a clip tip perhaps was the weak point in the blade and therefore wanting to do a, an edged weapon that would be suitable for diving I looked in history and found out that a spear point is much stronger and, and much more useful because when you're underwater, as a combat diver would be, you use it for everything besides cutting, for prying, for prodding, for opening, right. and the blade has to be significantly stronger and has to be thicker. Absolutely, so, yeah. so the weapon has weight to it. It also has a detachable anchoring system which again is a derivative of the Buckmaster, original Buckmaster. Right. And it, it meets the requirements as they exist in order to both anchor something underwater or use it to repel down or do anything because it has, the way it's designed, it'll take 500 pounds. So, so this particular one, I don't think the decision is yet made of if and when this thing might come to fruition, but there is certainly an opportunity if there's enough interest and the cost-benefit analysis proves, you know, positive that they would consider building this. So, and Buck would would be have the ex exclusive right to do that. Nice. So we we actually have one here, guys. It's a, it's a prototype, right? Yes, sir. It's prototype. It was handmade by an almost 85-year-old man who passed away a few years ago, Bob McDonald, the original um, uh, gentleman from uh, Qualitech. Yeah, made all Probus. the prototypes of the Buckmaster. Oh, the Buckmaster. Yeah, the he did. He did the but. Listen to this. He did the Buckmaster. He did the Buckmaster Light. He did the Model 186 Titanium Take Apart prototypes. He did the Combat Utility for the Seals prototypes. He did the M9 Bayonet prototypes. He was as, as uh, Tom would say, what would you say about Bob real quick? Well, you know, he was a brilliant, and I mean literally, he was a brilliant uh, designer, designer and fabricator. Yeah. And uh, he, was, he was partnered with some very talented people whose job it was to solve problems. Yeah. And 
the first Buckmaster solved a problem, and the Buckmaster 2.0 is is designed and hopefully built to also solve the problem. And he designed this before he passed. Uh, actually, the, yeah. uh, it's at the commander's request of what he wanted. Well, I gave him what I, I wanted. The blade. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I I drew pictures, and him and I we all worked together. All, yeah. all three of us worked together on it, I mean, which was honor. This is a tool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's definitely a tool because you can see all the different uh, things you've got. You want to talk about what, yeah, yeah. what's going on quick. with this? Well, it's, 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 it's going to be a nice, it's, it's a nice big. What's well, the length actually, of that? I, okay. It's a nice, uh, it's about a seven inch blade or so. There's okay. slight serrations on the bottom, no more than an inch and a half. Um, the teeth are going to be, if you guys know, go to Buck's website, the talon. The teeth on top are going to look like the new talon, and then they have another one, and, and uh, I don't know if they're, you're talking about the small one. I'm not talking at all. I'm listening. All right. All right. Okay. So it, uh, that's, be that's what, what we yeah, say. Yeah, that, yeah. That's what it, it looks like. But um, the tip of the blade is going to be about uh, four inches long without teeth, and then there's going to be some teeth on top just for cutting ability. What's so cool about the anchoring system is it can protect your hand, and there's going to be a way that they're attaching it. I'm not going to discuss too much of that here, yeah. but it's reversible, so it can go one way like the original Buckmaster, and then the reverse like we all used to do when we were kids and had those little pointy the pointy things, po the pointy up, things pointing point towards north. the blade, <laughs> right? Well, it turns out that. Um, in or you seat. make a grappling hook yeah. out of them like yeah. I did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, this one can actually hold 500 pounds now, where the original ones could only uh, hold 250. And that was in this Double one. The this capacity. is in this prototype form. I mean, the knife with, itself yeah. is, is beefier, too. So it's, it yeah, it's, it's going to have a, it's a, chunk. a lot more load capacity it, it as has, well. It has a substantial ability to do more heavy lifting work. Meaning underwater. prying, yeah, yeah. and the, and you the want whole, heavy underwater because you do. these things are exactly. hard to manipulate underwater. And you're going to have a lanyard attached to your because you can't afford to do it. But the entire thing will be able to be handled by a diver, a combat diver, with gloves in various conditions, and and be able to function. Use in, all the utilities on in it. the dark because you have to be able to function in the dark. True. He'll be able to take the anchor system off of the off of the sheath put it reverse it reverse it have whatever it configuration on. and do so in the dark yeah. and then they'll be able to fix it and and it'll have all the characteristics necessary very nice and there's a, a really nice hand done blood groove right down the center um and that's really cool uh, so I, I will say from a from a production standpoint it's always a challenge to take something crafted in a machine shop and and make something crafted in a factory that doesn't lose the performance of that which was made in the machine shop. And that's a challenge. Yeah. And so the, the, the work on this one continues uh, as we try and figure out how do we consistently manufacture and deliver right. a product. And I would expect yeah, I would expect if this Buckmaster 2.0 goes into production, it will not look identical to the prototype. Sure. It will have a strong resemblance, Very. but you have to consider the ability to manufacture this in a yep. cost-effective manner, so that you can obviously make a profit you know, on the sell of the product. Right. And, so as, and, and as we field it. test these things, there may be some absolutely that the prototypers didn't take into consideration. That, absolutely. Oh man, there's a failure point or there's a weakness. So, okay, we we'll fix that. Yeah. We'll fix that. And then of course, with this comes a sheath. Yep. Correct. Which, which is going to, I'm sure, have many capabilities as well. And, yep. You know. Yeah, the original one featured a, uh, a stone, a sharpening stone in the back, which was a very genius idea. Yeah. Um, and uh, that went through the, the M9 bayonet also had that. So. Very good. So where are we in the production? I know this is a prototype. I mean, we're, we're still what, what's the projection on getting this out? We're still a couple years away. For military consideration, a couple years? Actually, just consumer consideration. Oh, okay, so you're, yeah. you're going to hit the consumer it'd be, first? It'd be open to military as well. but. Uh, and, I, uh, and I think that there's... Well, I'm considering. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a consumer and I'm considering. Well, uh, And it, I'm a diver also. So, it's, yeah. it's important to, to realize that before someone commits to the tooling necessary, that they have to do the cost-benefit analysis to make sure 
that it makes sense, you know, and in all of the enthusiasm as me as a designer and, and Rich as a historian and a documenter, you know, we have lots of enthusiasm, but we don't have to bear the burden yeah. of producing the product. Yeah. So the financial that, burden. that enthusiasm has to be it's has bug. to be tempered <laughs> with reality. And that's why, you know, it's one of the reasons we're here this week to work with Buck to introduce it to them. And and it and I and I have to say that probably introducing it on your show may be considered a little bit premature, but well, we are but, the premature show. Yeah, but <laughs> but Buck was not premier. <laughs> but CJ and, and and the Buck Company have been kind enough to give us some latitude in introducing it to various people, oh, and great. and we have to admit that it's been Thank well you. received. And I, and I gotta say, it's an honor. I appreciate you guys uh, allowing us to do this. You know, I, I jest around and and kid, but I mean. To be able to to hold something in this state, the prototype state, a lot of people don't get to do that, you know. And we're very privileged that you guys uh, allow us to do this and share this with our listeners as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rich, Tom, yeah. CJ just had to bug out, but CJ as well. Yeah. Uh, this is this is beyond fascinating. I mean, my mind's I'm always thinking about stuff, you know. So I'm looking at this and you say it's not finished yet. I've always got ideas. So if you need ideas, you can come to me. All right. I would love to be part of the uh, development of this. Thank you. Very good. So one more time, give everybody where they can, name of the books, where they get them. Okay. The, the two books are at Buck Knives website. Yep. Um, and the, the names of the book is Buck Master Knives, The Authorized History of the Models 184-185, and the M9 Bayonet, The Authorized History. Very detailed, very researched yes. books, so you know that the information that is in there is not fake news. Not fake news. <laughs> Everything's Trump backed up and documented. There's and documents. documented. Yep. And are, did, were you showing me a, a, an old picture of the commander here? Is that, no, no. Is we that ne we never uh, do any pictures of the commander, but <laughs> it was an old picture from 1985 of some seals on the Zodiac. On the Zodiac, yeah. yeah. With a uh, with a Buckmaster. Very cool. Uh, 184. The, uh, on, so well, I've really fun. enjoyed hearing the history of this, and uh, uh, definitely I'm going to go get one of your books. I'm going to get both those books because uh, I like history, and, uh, and knowing the people that wrote the book and are about the book makes it that much more thank enjoyable. You. So thank you guys. All right, we appreciate you. Commander, thank you again so much for, for taking the time to be on. My pleasure. Thank you. I think I'm getting you out of your, out of your shell. <laughs> There, I don't have a shell, but we might be able to get that book one day, Rich. <laughs> noted. <laughs> yeah, noted. Noted. <laughs> exactly. All right, guys. Thank you. More coming from the 2019 Shot Show here at the official headquarters of Buck Knives. Oh man, that was fantastic! Wow. All I can say is wow. What an honor, what a privilege it was to have those guys on and share that information with us. Uh, make sure you guys go and uh, pick up Rich's book, man. Uh, it's a really good book. I've got it here. I've been reading it. Chock full of great history, uh, just like we talked about, and, you know, all those stories and more, and the pictures that he's got documenting all the different versions, all the prototypes of that Buckmaster knife. Uh, there's a tab, Buck Gear, at their website. And you can find uh, his book, Buckmaster Knives, and the book that he did on the M9 Bayonet, which we hope to get rich on and talk about that in an episode as well. I'm sure it's going to be equally uh, interesting. Thank you to Rich, Commander Coulter, and uh, CJ for that interview. And as promised, we've got lots more interviews from the 2019 SHOT Show from the official headquarters of Buck Knives. We've got interviews with Geisley, Fiocchi, Ride On, Walk the Talk America. Uh, we've got some leadheads that made some appearances, uh, being our men on the street, giving us updates on some other cool other products and companies that we weren't able to get on to do interviews with. Uh, we've got Zenith Firearms, Filson Outfitters. We've got Christy Titus coming up. Uh, a couple called Steve and Jennifer Morgan. They've been doing some uh, very cool outdoor and fitness things. Uh, and several more. So, so like I said earlier, make sure you're checking your podcasting feeds frequently for new episodes dropping. And I haven't forgot about the Talking Lead, Streamlight, Buck Knives, Fleoa, EDC Pocket Dump Rewards Program. We've got two more of those to give out to LEs. 
And we're going to be doing that in some upcoming episodes. So you've still got some time to participate. Uh, all the civilian ones have been given out. And a big thanks to everyone who has participated. Go back to our previous episodes. If you want to participate, you can listen and find out on those episodes and what you need to do to enter uh, for these last two Pocket Dump EDC rewards packages that we're giving out that include a Streamlight flashlight, a Buck Knives knife, and a Defy Battlefield watch provided by Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association. And then, of course, I mentioned we've got our 300th episode coming up, and we'd really like to do something special uh, for that episode. We're looking for your suggestions, Leadheads, so send me an email, talkingled at gmail.com. Put in the subject 300th episode suggestions uh, on guest, maybe a, a promotional giveaway or something like that that you guys might be interested in. Uh, had a couple of you guys do that already. Keep them coming. Talkingled at gmail.com. Send me your suggestions on that. So just a quick update on some things we've got coming up. We've got the next episode of the Talking Lead AK Corner coming up this month. And our guests are going to be James Yeager and Sonny Pazikas. So send me your questions that you want me to ask Jaeger and Pazikas. Send them talkingletgmail.com. Put in the subject AK Corner, uh, Jaeger, Pazikas, you know, something along those lines so I'll know what it is. And uh, it's going to be a crazy interview, I can tell you that. Last time we had those two guys on, it was nuts. Uh, I can assure you that the connection will be much better this time. I'm, I'm actually going to be in the same room with these guys up in Camden, Tennessee, and uh, it's it's going to be a good one. I'm really looking forward to the next episode of the Talking Lead AK Corner. And, of course, we're going to be giving away another Pioneer Arms Corps AK-47. Also coming up in March, March the 9th, at Royal Range USA. If any of you lead heads are going to be around, you're going to want to stop by Royal Range. They're going to have a, a company called Nemesis Arms visiting that day. And uh, Nemesis is making some very cool precision shooting rifles. And we plan on attending. That's March 9th, Royal Range USA. You can go to Royal Range's Facebook page and get details on that event that they're going to have. They usually have some good deals and sales going on. I know uh, last month they had rugged suppressors out there. And we're going to be getting those guys on the show soon. Uh, but they were giving such great deals. I think they sold somewhere around a couple of dozen suppressors that day because of the the special deals that they were running. And they actually gave one away, too. They were doing a, a suppressed MP5 shooting contest. And it was really cool. Full auto MP5 that Rugged Suppressors uh, did. And they do that across the country, apparently. So uh, check to see if rug, Rugged Suppressors is going to be at a range near you. And you might have an opportunity to win one of their, their cool cans. And, of course, at the end of March, we've got the Big 3 East media event down in Daytona Beach, Florida. And Talking Lead will be there as well. We'll be bringing you all kinds of great interviews of the latest and greatest that's going on with, with all the attending companies at that event. And then in the month of April, we've got NRA coming up. We've got the Sheepdog Impact Assistance Gala and Auction up in Rogers, Arkansas. I'd made an announcement earlier that if any of you lead heads wanted to take part in that gala and, and auction, you can go to sheepdogia.org, and there's, you, there's a link there where you can click on to buy tickets to attend the gala and auction event. Uh, or if you guys want to donate, get in touch with me, talking at gmail.com. Uh, put SDIA auction in the in the subject, and if you're you're a company and you've got uh, some items that you'd like to donate for that auction, let me know. I've had several of you guys reach out to me and in, and are going to be donating to that. Uh, so thank you very much for doing that. Uh, it's going to be a great event, guys. And I can just tell you from Talking Leads partners and friends of the show that are donating to that, uh, we've got Glock. Glock's going to be doing a gun. Keltec's going to be doing a KSG shotgun. Eagle Imports is sending a pistol. Uh, X Steel Targets is going to be having some targets there. Martin Spartan Systems. Pioneer Arms Corps is going to be donating an AK. Uh, Taylor Guitars. Um, Bob said he would love to send an autographed guitar for that auction. So we've got that. Uh, and many, many, many more. 
and that's just of from the Talking Lead family. Uh, so I know there's going to be even more awesome things to to auction on at that event. So if you want to have a good time and donate to a great organization, it'd be an awesome event to attend. So if you don't have anything to do, uh, make plans with you and your sweetie, and you know take her to a gala. It's a it's a dress up kind of event. So it's a very cool kind of getaway. So. Check them out, sheepdogia.org to get all that information. And don't forget, if you guys want to to get some training and get a discount on some training, some good training, we've got a collaboration that we're doing with ICE Training and Rob Pincus, April the 6th at Royal Range USA. You guys can go to icetraining.us and sign up for those classes. Make sure that you designate that you are a Talking Lead listener, subscriber, and uh, they're going to set you up with a discount uh, for that class April 6th in Nashville. And then we also have one in Pala, California, July the 20 or July the 17th. Sorry, it's Pala, California, July the 17th. Uh, and then Exeter, California, July the 20th. Uh, and then we're working on putting together some, some other courses, uh, not only with Rob, but with some other trainers also. So stay tuned for that. A big thanks to all the companies that bring you the Talking Lead podcast, X Steel Targets. X Steel Targets. The best, most affordable AR500 steel targets on the market today are X Steel Targets. Make sure you guys go show them some love on their social media as well. Instagram uh, is where they do a lot of their postings. It's X Steel Targets on the Instagram. Let them know you're a lead head. And we have discount codes set up with all of our partners and friends of the show. Uh, it's typically Leadhead, but if you're at one of our our sponsor's sites and it's not working, let me know and I'll make sure that they reactivate that. Right on Optics, the official optics of Talking Lead, they offer a Leadhead discount. Modern Spartan Systems, for all your gun cleaning, lubrication needs, Modern Spartan Systems, they're offering a discount code there as well. 1776 United, the official swag of Talking Lead, I mean, those guys are always running discounts on their stuff. They don't really need a code for that because they've got deals uh, that they run pretty much weekly. And I know, you know, St. Paddy's Day is coming up, and they're going to have some specials for that. I think they've got a special St. Paddy's Day T-shirt, a 1776 United, not a Talking Lead T-shirt. Uh, but you can get your Leadhead Brigade shirts, your Leadhead Brigade patches, the original Talking Lead T-shirt. You, know, you can get it there as well, 1776united.com. And for your drinkware, I mean, if you guys aren't rocking the evil black assault mug, the Talking Leddy, yet, you need to go to dip123.com forward slash Talking Lead and pick one of those up. We've got two different sizes there. And, uh, you know, don't be a snowflake. Go pick one of those up. Better than a Yeti, the Talking Leddy keeps your drinks minutes colder. Dip123.com forward slash Talking Lead. Get your Talking Leddy. And then Caltech Weapons, go to caltechweapons.com. Can't get a discount on their firearms. They don't sell the firearms on their website. you got to go to your local gun dealer to get uh, to get their guns. Uh, but they do have swag there, and they do have other things. They, I think they've got knives. They've got flashlights. They've got T-shirts, hats. Uh, and then you can get your accessories from them also. So for your Sub 2000, for your SU-16s, your RFB, your RDBs, your KSGs, your PMR30s, whatever it may be, accessory-wise, you can pick those up at their, web, at their website, at KillTechWeapons.com. Don't have a discount code set up with them yet on that kind of stuff, but uh, if you go to their website and you're ordering something, let them know that you're a supporter of Talking Lead, and our good buddy Chad over there will do his best to try to hook you up with something. So that does it for another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast, Leadheads. Thank you so much for the support. And if you haven't done so yet, please, on iTunes, leave us some feedback. Uh, we need to get those ratings up on iTunes. You guys have been doing great so far. We've really been pushed up in the rankings on that. We greatly appreciate it. Keep it up. Tell your mother, brother, friend, cousin, aunt, uncle. Tell everybody to go and subscribe to us on iTunes. Download. Listen to us. Uh, can't get iTunes. I mean, I don't do Apple. I hate Apple products. So, you know, I've got an Android. I listen on Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, uh, and then we even post on YouTube. I had uh, had several of you lead heads that say you, you can't listen on the other apps, and YouTube's it. So we post all our show on YouTube also. 
And then you can always catch us at our website, www.talkinglead.com. And then also, if you haven't done so, on Instagram and Facebook, go and subscribe and support us on those platforms as well. Facebook, I know they have been really choking us down, so I could really use a push from you leadheads. Go and get people to like our page on Facebook. I need to get those numbers up uh, because they have been really choking us down on that. So all the support that you guys can give us on that, too, is greatly appreciated. So thank you, thank you, thank you guys for all the support. And until next time, as always, Leadheads, keep your loved ones close and you keep those dadgum firearms closer.